welcome everybody. I just want to start with our acknowledgement of country. Um, Geoscience Australia acknowledges traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the people, the cultures and the elders past and present. Um, I'm mindful of the presentation we had from Lindley uh, recently uh, and what a great communicator she was. Um, so it was uh, wonderful to see uh, how she as an Indigenous person combined the sort of uh, cultural background and that wonderful uh, background and expertise as a presenter. Um, today's seminar is We Think Earth Science Rocks Pause for Gravitas, um, but does the public agree? And it's presented by Alice Ryder, Louise Soroka and Dominic Ifland. Our uh, discovery and engagement team are developing a comprehensive plan to make our public spaces and programs more inclusive for staff, visitors and staff. It's a, it's a multi-year journey to find effective ways to showcase the varied work of our staff and the relevance of earth science to all Australians. To do this work, to inform it, we have a series, did a series of audience research studies across a range of audiences um, to understand more about people's knowledge and attitudes towards earth science as a topic. We also did a literature review, public surveys, focus groups and audience testing for a new exhibit called Rocks That Shape Australia. So we'll present um, that uh, work today and it's combined with recent findings from some outreach work by the Exploring for the Future Geoscience Knowledge Sharing Project. Um, they've given me um, lengthy biographies and they've sort of said, can I get through them faster so they have more time to talk? So I will get through these in a nutshell. Alice is our Client and Visitor Services Manager here. She brings 20 years experience in science communication inter interpretation. Uh, she's worked for Questacon, we have that in common, Geoscience Australia, Tasmanian Parks. Um, she's a self-described evaluation and signage nerd and loves finding creative ways uh, to tell stories about Australia's natural heritage while respecting the agency and intelligence of visitors. Um, she was also involved in the WA Museum's new museum project. If you haven't had a chance to see that, find time because it's it's an example of what future museums will look like. So uh, fantastic job uh, working on that, Alice. Louise is a public spaces and uh, public programs and spaces officer. Uh, after 10 years working as a geoscientist, she realised it was um, talking about science was more fun, and so she's moved over. Uh, she has also worked for Questacon. There's a bit of a theme developing here, and Edinburgh Science um, uh, in person and virtually. She was part of the great pivot to the digital in, in COVID, um, and now combines uh, that science background and science communication in Geoscience Australia. Uh, she's the one that's meeting many of our school groups, doing tours, um, and is developing our rather exciting uh, public program, which we hope will include an adults only night. Dom, Dom is uh, devout, well, not, he's, he's not a geoscientist, that's felt needed to say that up front. Uh, he's, a, he's an animal biologist, um, works in the access engagement team and is, uh, uh, has worked in the education team. Been doing this sort of work for about eight years, worked with students in Tasmania, Alice, Springs, Cairns, Darwin, Walgett, well, got a show, that's great. And in many places in between. Love sharing his passion for science for all types and specific, specific, specifically likes to get more biological and ecological context into his work, even at GA. Coming up. Now we just need to turn this down a little bit. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Rod, for that wonderful introduction. And thanks to everyone here for joining us today to talk about the public perceptions of Earth science, whether you're joining us in person or online. So we, as in Alice, Dom and myself, think Earth science rocks. And the chances are, if you're joining us for this presentation, you think Earth science rocks, or at least you have some sort of interest in it. But does the public agree? That is what we're going to discuss with you today. So Rod has already done a fantastic acknowledgement of country. I would like to uh, add our voices to that acknowledgement and that respect. And I also like to remind our public visitors when they come in that we're talking a lot about earth science today. And the first people that were doing earth science here on these lands were our traditional owners who lived amongst the geology and the landscapes. Again, Rod's done a fantastic job of introducing us, so I won't harp on here too much. Just want to say, uh, if you have any questions about 
who we are, what we've done, feel free to come up and have a chat after the talk. And especially if you're interested in science communication or maybe how your job can look as fun as, you know, Dom with his Y and lay in that picture there. But without any further ado, I will hand over to Alice, who's going to introduce what is audience research. Thank you, Louise. Can everyone hear me okay in the audience? Beautiful. So I before we jump into a bunch of talking, I want to avoid using jargon that might catch people's attention, have them distracted by jargon and missing some of the fun things that we want to share today. So our talk is about audience research, and I don't want to take it for granted that that's a term that everyone is familiar with, but it's actually kind of what you would imagine. It's researching or finding out more about what an audience thinks. In our case, as Rod mentioned, Geoscience Australia is undertaking a program to redevelop its public spaces over the next couple of years. So when we think about audiences, in this case, we're thinking about people who visit our public spaces or who are potential visitors who maybe we can entice to come and visit us. So by doing audience research, we're finding out about those audiences, why they come to visit us, some barriers they might have to visiting and what they want to do when they come to visit us. And we can divide that broader world of audience research into sort of two categories, formative evaluation or formative research and summative evaluation or summative research. So formative research happens before you undertake a project. Usually in our case, our project is to improve our public spaces. We can do broad scale audience research, again, looking at the demographics and the interests and the motivations of potential visitors. And we can also do something called concept testing. That we'll talk about more later today. And that's where rather than asking them in general what they're interested in, we present them with a specific idea and get feedback on that. Then once we've done our project, it's really important that we don't just leave it in the foyer and never talk to it again. We should check if it's actually communicating what we think we're communicating. So that sort of research is called summative research and it happens after the fact. Both qualitative and quantitative techniques can be used in audience research. And there's a lot of rigor that goes behind that research. So while we're going to be talking in a very high level today, if people have questions later on and wanna dig down into the methodologies that we're, we've used, we're happy to get very, very nerdy about that after the session. As Rod said, I am an accidental evaluation nerd. It catches the best of us by surprise. So today I'm going to start off our talk by looking at that really big picture, some research that we did into our potential audiences before I hand over to Louise and Dom for some specific case studies. So one of the projects that we conducted last year was to reach out and look at our potential audiences through a series of public surveys and focus groups. We did two public surveys one of which, and the one I'm going to focus on today, was our population survey. This is where we paid people to do our survey. You might see on Facebook, make money in your spare time by doing surveys. And usually you'll be asked about what brand of toothpaste you like the best. In this case, rather than being asked about toothpaste, a representative sample of the population from Sydney, regional New South Wales and Victoria, seen as places that might come to visit us one day, were asked questions about their interest in earth science. And then we also ran five focus groups, two with teenagers as our proxy for our 10,000 school visitors who visit us every single year, one with adults aged 25 to 60, one with adults aged over 60, and one with teachers. So, Rather than just talk at you this entire time, as lovely as my voice is, I wanted to invite people both online and in the audience to play a bit of a game. You might be familiar with family food from its Burt Newton days or from its more recent days. I'd like someone really brave in the audience to put up their hand and have a guess at what percentage of our representative population sample said that they agreed that they were totally fascinated by earth science and always keen to learn more. I'll give you a hint, it's between zero and 100. <laughs> any, any hands up for a guess? Go for it. 6%. 6 thank you. Does we have, we have one more guess? 30%. 30 oh, more optimism from the chief scientist. I love it. Let's take one more guess. Zero, oh, from our, from, from our big boss. That makes me a bit worried, James. Okay, let's see who was closest. Um, Steve, you can pay me later because you were the closest guesser. In fact, 
there is really broad scale interest in earth science. 43% of that population sample said they were totally fascinated by earth science. And a further 33% of the population said they were interested in science in general, but maybe not specifically earth science. What that tells us is we have a huge number of people who are potentially interested in engaging with our work. So we can take a bit of a breather sigh of relief. There's lots of people who are interested. We just have to figure out how to engage with them and bring them in to engage with us specifically. And our other survey, our cascading survey of sort of friends of friends of friends of GA was very sim similar. In fact, they like S science a little bit more, which makes sense. Now our next question. We offered a number of different terms, some with positive associations and some perhaps with negative or challenging associations that could potentially be used to describe earth science. So what comes to mind when members of the public think about the topic of earth science? Have a look and put up your hand if you can call out something that you think many people might associate with earth science. And my apologies for those online. I hope that you are thinking through these activities yourselves as well. Up the back. Beautiful. OK, interesting. Yes. Any other thoughts about terms that might be associated with earth science and by proxy GA's work? Fascinating. OK, they're both positive, so let's see if most of the answers were positive. In fact, they were and you've done a really good job picking out fascinating. Well done, Andrew. And beautiful was also in the middle, so well done up the back. So the top keywords and phrases that came to mind for people were that it helps care for the environment. So earth science has practical, useful applications for the world. It's fascinating, important and economically important. And just as interestingly, destructive was only in, came to mind for 2% of people, feminine, masculine and boring and not relevant to my life. Again, this is great news. People think that our work can be relevant, can be fascinating, can be important. So we've got lots of potential converts to get excited about our public spaces and our work more broadly. Anytime I'm talking about public spaces, if you want to, you can subtract that term and think about my work when I'm talking to the wider public. Now, we zoomed in a little bit to look at if one of these uh, people who are in Sydney or Melbourne or regional New South Wales was to come to visit Geoscience Australia, what would they most like to do when they came to visit our public spaces? We gave them a whole lot of options and again, we let them choose their, their top three and spoiler alert, people want to do a mix of everything. But then if we are a bit cheeky and we force them to pick their top thing that they most want to do when they visit us, can anyone think about the most appealing thing, the most important thing that people wanted to do here? That's a hard one. Up the back. Learn about First Nations connection to earth science. Thank you, Joe. Does anyone want to have one more guess? Pardon? They want to learn about the people behind the science. Thank you, Verity. Well, Joe might be cheating because he has actually seen this before or he may legitimately just have a really good feel for the population because he's actually right. People want to do all of these activities, but the thing that people most wanted to do from that population sample was to learn about Indigenous Australians, their connection to earth science historically and their work in earth science sectors today, which is interesting because our public spaces at the moment spend very, very, very little time talking about that. Um, visiting the National Mineral and Fossil Collection was really popular. Well, we're ticking that item off. Um, and while most of this population sample had never heard of GA prior to doing our survey, they were interested in learning more about its people and its work as well. So that was surprising and something that we should keep in mind as we look at improving our public spaces. Then we jumped into focus groups. So surveys, that sort of quantitative work, is great at asking what people think. Focus groups are great at asking why people think those things, why they feel the way they do. And the first thing we did was talk to our focus groups about Geoscience Australia's mission and to get their responses and their feelings, things that they thought were great about that mission, things they were confused about, things they wanted to learn more about. And all of the focus groups had quite sophisticated questions. But in a lot of contexts, they wanted to understand how we can balance out different aspects of our work. So how can we work for both a strong economy, 
but also care for our environment? How can we balance those different perceived tensions between some aspects of our work? And importantly, our, teenager, our teenagers actually asked really thoughtful and critical, not angry critical, but deep thinking critical questions about this work as well. Then we talked about some of the different aspects of our work as described through Strategy 2028 as a good structure for us, if not the public, to think about questions that they'd have about different aspects of our work. And I'm going to run through our different impact areas and talk about a couple of highlights that came out. So hopefully, is anyone in the audience working in an area that relates to building Australia's resources well? Excellent. Okay. This slide's for you, as they would say on the radio. This next one's just for you. So. There were some real perceived tensions between using resources and mineral extraction and then our work in emissions reduction. So there were some questions, not in an angry way, but again, in a deep thinking way about, is that talking about emissions reduction, sort of a look over, look over here, distraction from our other work? Or are we doing both of these pieces of work in good faith and really, really deeply? Climate change was seen as a massive issue for all groups. Um, maps and visual tools have real appeal, especially for older audiences. Give them a map and they were delighted and wanted to know more and more about it. And teachers were really keen for their students to debate and discuss mining. Um, they felt that often students had negative associations with mining and didn't hear about positive aspects and impacts of mining, so they wanted to have those debates. But our teen focus groups were quite aware of the importance of, it, of mining for the economy and we're aware that mines can have positive impacts. So there was perhaps a disconnect between what teachers thought, students thought, and what they actually think. But giving space for that debate and discussion was seen as really important. Next up, we talked about supporting community safety. Have we got any community safety reps in the audience today? Yes, a few nods, excellent. Um, there was real surprise that Geoscience Australia works in this area. People sort of went, Geoscience Australia, that sounds geology-ish. That sounds rockish. So why are you working in community safety? But it was an area of huge interest and it had very apparent links to people's everyday lives. So it was easy to connect with and therefore it's something that people wanted to learn more about. Um, older adults had really strong feelings that First Nations knowledge systems in terms of hazards, so in the management of fire, for example, should be better considered by GA, but also by the world more broadly. Um, and again, teachers thought this would be very relevant to students because it's related to their everyday lives. These focus groups were happening just after the big East Coast flooding. So this was a very, very, very relevant topic. Uh, and the idea of technology, both for teenagers and for adults, was seen as really interesting. So what role does technology play in the mitigation of hazards? It's something they really wanted to get their teeth stuck into. Securing Australia's water resources. Again, more broadly, not just, GA, not just for GA, but there was a strong feeling that the government has managed water poorly in the past. And the Murray-Darling Basin came up again and again and again. It was seen as the archetypal case study in this space. Um, again, there was a little bit of surprise that GA worked in this area and a feeling that we'd need to work collaboratively. Now we do work collaboratively, but maybe we need to tell people that better. And there was some real confusion about the idea of groundwater. So what exactly is it? How do we know if we're using it sustainably? Is it in caves? Is it in tiny pore spaces? Can you put the groundwater back in? How do you know where it is? So that's something that we might need to spend some time engaging and building up some baseline knowledge before we talk about our work in that area. Managing Australia's marine areas was also considered really important for Australia as an island. Um, and changing coastlines and beach erosion were seen as a really familiar touch point for many people. But basically, the further away from the coast you get, the harder it is to imagine this topic. So things like maritime boundaries were seen as being a little bit more abstract. So perhaps if we're talking about our work here, we start at the familiar, we start next door to people, unless you're sad and you live in Canberra away from the beach, and then you move outwards from there. And then we get to creating a location enabled Australia. This was the topic that was most confusing for all of our focus groups. Perhaps we didn't do a very good job at explaining it, um, but it was a new idea for many people and many people sort of uh, made a mental leap to being worried about being tracked or being hacked or are people going to spy on me and look at where I'm going. Satellite image was seen as really interesting and beautiful as was set up the back, but linking that to other work in our areas in the in, 
other work in this area was a slightly confusing topic for audiences. So this is something we need to think really carefully about when we go forward and communicate more about it. But again, technology was of interest to many people, especially young people and teachers. So that's what people think about Geoscience Australia's work really broadly. Now I'd like to hand over to Louise, who's going to take us through a case study talking about that concept testing. So now that we know what people think in general, what do they think about a specific idea we want to share with them? Thank you all for playing Family Feud. You did very, very well. And I'll hand over to Louise. Thanks, Alice, for giving us some real insights into what our public might think and feel about earth science. Uh, and as Rod hinted at the beginning, the reason we want to know what the public might think and feel about earth science is because we are planning to make some developments to the public programs we are offering and also to the public spaces that we have here at the building in Geoscience Australia. So one of the uh, earlier changes to our public spaces will be a new exhibition that will be called Rocks That Shapes Australia, Shape Australia. It's based on a paper that some of you might have read called The Seven Rocks That Made Australia by Dr. Marita Bradshaw. And the theme of the paper looks at seven rocks and how they've helped Australia develop as a nation. So the stories told about the rocks often have a big economic impact that's quite obvious, but often if you scratch just below the surface, there's other stories you can tell using these rocks about Australia's social development, our environment and our human histories as well. So the big idea for the exhibition is to have rocks, obviously, but to also have them accompanied by objects and these stories. So the best way to explain how this will work would be to give you an example. So one of the rocks that Marisa describes is our Victorian gold ore. An object that is planned to accompany that is a gold rush era miners pick and some coins that were brought over by a Chinese person who came across to mine in the gold rush. So the story panel will talk about the occurrence of gold in Victoria, but it will also talk about the human impact for the people that came over and also about the development of Australia, because this in many ways was the birth of a really multicultural Australia and the first time we had mass immigration to our nation. So when looking to plan this exhibition, we wanted to know what stories appeal to the public. And we want the exhibition to potentially appeal to people who don't say, yes, I'm really interested in geology or I really love rocks. So we're trying to find stories that appeal to people with different interests as well. We also wanted to know, in addition to the seven rocks described by Marita, what extra rocks we might want to include as part of this exhibit. So to find out. We did something called concept testing, as Alice mentioned, and what this involved was Alice, Dom and myself went out to Questacon. We were there just after the New Year, so I think it was like 3rd and 4th of January, so very early in the year. Lots of people on holiday, a very busy time and a high traffic time for Questacon. And we set up in their Q lab. So if you're familiar with Questacon, this is a lab bench space that is often facilitated by Questacon staff where people can come up, uh, see a demo, do something hands on, and they let us use about half of their space for those two days. So we split our concept testing into two halves. In the mornings, we wanted to know of the seven rocks identified by Marita, which story was the most appealing for each of those rocks. So our setup was a little bit like you can see on the right hand side of the slide there. We had some sheets set out, the rock sat in the gap that you're seeing there, so the actual rock that we want to use for the exhibit. And then we had three or four different stories for each rock that we could tell using that rock. So when people approached the bench, we asked them if they were interested in geology and we gave them sticky dots depending on whether they said, yeah, I like geology or not so much. We then asked them to vote on which story for each of the rocks appealed to them. So that's what you can see there. Some people have put votes on the broken hill or sheet. In the afternoon, we mixed it up. We wanted to answer the question of which additional rocks we should include. So for this part of the activity, we didn't actually have the rocks. So we had sheets that had a picture of the rock and then we gave our participants three sticky dots and they got to choose the rock that appealed to them. We only presented one story per rock in this part. So how did we go? So first of all, our seven rocks as identified by Marita, we found a favourite story for each of those. In the vast majority of cases, there's a really clear favourite that people found more appealing than the other ones we presented. 
We found the results were fairly consistent between people that said they liked geology and those who said not so much, which was interesting for us. We wasn't sure if that would be uh, the same for both groups of people. And oh, one thing I forgot to tell you was in addition to voting on their favourite story for each rock, we gave people a super like sticky dot. So this was the one that they could put on their favourite story out of all the rocks. Um, and we found that there was two very clear overall favourites in that part of it as well. And both of those stories related to environmental history, which was quite interesting. The first one related to our Permian coal sample. The text that was included with that um, picture of that story is on the slide, but it was about the ancient forests and swamps that were the environments that coal was deposited in. And people found this quite interesting. And similarly, the Cretaceous sediment. We said it was evidence for Australia's inland sea and it contained fossils of marine reptiles from the time of the dinosaurs. The two pictures that were included in the story there are on the slide, and I think you can see probably why these captured people's imaginations, because they look uh, very interesting and obviously quite evocative. So for our afternoon session, when we're looking at additional rocks, uh, the sheets in the bottom here are what it looked like. We didn't actually have the rock. As I said, we had a picture of the rock and then an accompanying picture that linked to the story we we're telling. We found that the most popular additional rock that we presented was the South Australian quartzite, and it's linked to the Ediacaran fossils. And this was even when compared to other stories about other fossil sites that we had. So on the slide there, you can see we've got the um, Ediacaran fossils up against the Mergen fossils and the Ediacarans were the clear favourites. And talking to people, that was because they're so unique and so ancient. We also found that people were interested in future focus rocks and stories. So the best example of this was one of the suggested rocks was a, a granite pegmatite. We have obviously it's linked to lithium and uh, batteries and electric vehicles. The image that accompanied that rock was a Tesla car, which was very exciting for a lot of people. And they're very interested in that link between the rock and the Tesla. There's also an interest including a story related to First Nations Australians. So we presented three rocks that had a First Nations story link. Um, and there wasn't really a clear favourite amongst the three, but lots of people were quite uh, verbal in thinking that we should have a story. One of the three should be included. People often said as well that they were rain, uh, surprised by the range of stories that could be told using rocks, and that it was quite hard to choose just three in this part of the activity. So that last comment was a bit of an anecdote. So while we're talking about anecdotes, I've got a few more for you just based on our experience over the two days. So when we went in to do this concept testing, uh, Alice had done a lot of concept testing before. It was my first time. I was quite sceptical that people would want to stop and talk to us and look at our rocks when we were at Questacon where there was a lot of exciting things going on, a lot of displays, a lot of facilitators. But Alice was right, I was wrong. People were very willing and very curious as to what we were doing there. And this was true both in the mornings when we actually had rocks on the bench, which might draw people in, but it was also true in the afternoons where we didn't even have rocks. We just had sheets of paper. People were still very curious to come over and see and to be part of our activity. We also found the imagery could be appealing to people. So this sounds like a great thing, but it potentially influenced our results as well. So on this slide, I've included uh, one of the images that was on our gold or uh, testing sheet. The actual text was not, in my opinion, very exciting. It was about the GDP value of gold historically, but the picture, which maybe I foolishly chose to include, was this one of the gold ingots. And you'd see people look at the sheet with their sticky dot, looking to make their vote, see the picture of the ingots, their greedy eyes light up, and that's where they put their sticker. <laughs> probably without having actually read the text that was associated with it. We also found that the majority of people said they were interested in geology when we asked. So we think it was about over three quarters of people said, yeah, yeah, I like geology. So this is probably due to a couple of factors. One, we're at Questacon. So we found a science seeking audience. Everyone there had chosen to come to Questacon on their day off in their holidays. So they probably already had some interest in science. But the second factor, which is a little bit, I guess, less desirable, was we think that people wanted to say yes because they wanted to do our activity. And no matter how we try to word it to make them realise that they could do it either way, there seemed to be this belief that if they said no, they didn't like geology, we weren't going to give them, take their sticky dots off them and tell them that they can't play with our rocks. Something else that I found really interesting personally was if a family group approached and there was kids in the group, often if you ask mum and dad if they like geology, then you ask the kids if they liked rocks. Quite often kids can pull a rock out of a pocket or a rock that's on a necklace or a chain. So that was quite interesting to me because I, yeah, sort of reinforces my belief that kids are often inherently interested in the natural world and in rocks. 
Okay, so we did our, our concept testing. Since then, we have gone away and come up with an exhibition plan. So this is uh, artwork that's been done by the designer that we're working with on this. So if you are in our building or familiar with our building, uh, the image on the left shows, I guess, where this exhibit will potentially be going. So the cafe entrance is just off the image to the left hand side. The maps of Australia are on that tall vertical wall that you can see behind it uh, and the geomags currently on that window. So this is the area that has been planned for this exhibit. Some glass cabinets will be moving down the street uh, and Steve, our collections manager, is very proactive in being part of this exhibition and in also relocating the things that we've already got in our foyer. So the design for the exhibit is intended to be a modular cube design. So this is intended so we can add to it later. So not all cubes will be full initially and it also gives us some flexibility with what we include. So in this artist impression, you can see some rocks featured. They all look like big lumps of coal, but they're not. I promise you that's the artist impression of the rocks. And you'll see that some of those objects are featured as well. So while some of the objects are small, so like I said, we'll have some coins from a Chinese miner, some of them will be large as well. So there's a taxidermy wallaby, some living plants, and also a hanging ichthyosaur are part of the current plan. The Big panel with the blue and the rocks that shape Australia is the current artwork and colour scheme that is planned for the exhibit and that's going to be going on one of the walls so it'll be quite big and quite eye-catching and then that colour scheme will continue throughout the exhibit so that it sort of sits together as it's one thing even though it's kind of spread over quite an area. Uh, the signage as well, but a little bit there, you probably can't see much, but you can see there's a map showing where each rock comes from. And then interestingly, there's also a QR code. So while we can't get lots and lots of text on the panel, we do have the opportunity to include extra stories and extra themes that we can talk about with each rock via the QR code. So this is becoming sooner rather than later, so it should be going in the middle of this year. So I'd encourage you to, when you see it go in, come over, have a look, let us know what you think. Uh, and then once it's in, as, as Alice said, our evaluation work is not done. So then we move to the summative evaluation phase. So we're going to want to look and see, do people like it? Do people not like it? What do they like? What don't they like? How do they interact with it? How much time do they spend there? And to give you an example of a project where this has already been done, I will hand over to Dom. Well, my head's not cut off. Um, thanks, Louise. So yeah, as Louise just said, we've looked at this formative evaluation. Now we're going to have a, a, a deep dive into some summative evaluation. And we took uh, these mobile exhibits created by Keith Sircombe for use with the mobile lab, uh, with help from the education access team uh, uh, as part of the Exploring for the Future Geoscience Knowledge Sharing Project. Uh, they were designed in collaboration with Questacon and built in their workshop as part of our memorandum of understanding. And the Canberra show, 24th to 26th of Feb this year, was their first radio out into the public. We wanted to see how the public engaged with the exhibits and to gather some feedback on how the public felt about Earth science. Uh, these are the four tubs here. Um, at the top left, we have types of rock. Igneous, metamorphic, sedimentary rocks, and a magnifying glass for public to to really get nice and close with those rocks. We've got mapping underground, just the top right there, sliding a magnetic piece of film over the landscape to see uh, uh, magnetic deposits underground. We've got what do you think? Uh, what do you think is underground on the bottom left? Public was asked a question or read that question on the board and were encouraged to draw what they thought was underground. And that last one on the bottom right, uh, Properties of Rocks, which was a very inquiry uh, centred uh, exploration of, of rocks and their physical properties. Um, from chatting to different people here at Geoscience Australia, in past previous evaluation of other events and, and products have been more focused towards the count of people that, that have attended and, and a record of some questions asked, things like that. So for these interactive exhibits, we really wanted to know how people behaved and how they used them. Uh, as I said before, these tubs were officially tested at the Canberra show and to evaluate their success or shortfalls, we used two techniques. We used a broad scale technique of our presence at the Canberra show on the whole. And then we also used a more targeted evaluation uh, of the tub exhibits themselves. Uh, 
Uh, and to evaluate that broader scale, we use the survey called Happy or Not, which is very similar to the smiley faces that you hit as you leave IKEA, um, with a follow-up question on what was your favourite thing there, and then a, a little open field for any thoughts or suggestions. Uh, and then for the more finer evaluation of the tubs themselves, we, and I mean Alice, had the idea to use observational evaluation to evaluate how successful the tubs were. And the idea here is to sit in a corner with a sheet of paper with a whole lot of behaviours on the paper. You would select a person as they walk into the booth and you would observe their behaviour. And if they did a behaviour on your sheet, you would circle it. And the idea here again is to be very consistent with who you choose. If there's a group of people walking in, always select the left person, always select the right person. You can't swap people halfway through because someone else is doing something more interesting, but you want to gather that information. That's not how we collect data. So uh, this is the happy or not data. There were 228 responses just on this uh, piece of technology alone. And what did we learn? The top three exhibits here, tectonic puzzle, interactive seismometers, and the tub exhibits were the favorites of the people uh, that completed this survey. And this might highlight that people are, are, are more interested in active participation and learning, getting hands on. Um, and does this mean that? In my experience, yes. And from observation, these interactive exhibits were almost a gateway to the rest of the booth. So people would see these exhibits, do a bit of interaction, then come in and go further into the booth and, and have a chat to some of us and really start to learn about more of what we're doing. Uh, some of the pain points in the evaluation data are really interesting to look at as well. Uh, there seems to be a need for clearer signage and more variety of activities. And then that second one, the variety of activities, is really interesting to me because I see that as a, as a desire for the public to, to engage more and to learn more. Um, have more opportunities for interaction and engagement. And right at the end of that happy or not survey, we had a little bit of open feedback. Uh, this one should be taken with a grain of salt because there was no actual prompting question. It was just a text box that people could enter into. So there was a lot of spam that we had to filter through. Um, and a lot of the a lot of the feedback we got here was positive. So pat on the back for us there. But I. Uh, my favourite piece of feedback from this, if I can have such a thing, uh, is right down the bottom, maybe have more things that someone can do. So again, reinforcing that the people, the public, the people um, are really looking for more for more things to engage with and, and are hungry for geoscience knowledge. Looking at the evaluation, the observation data now from our tracking and timing sheets, um, each of the exhibits are a different colour along the bottom there, and the numbers on the bottom is just the, the number of observations that we that we circled. And on the y-axis, there are the different observations that we were looking for, sorry, the different behaviours we were looking for. Um, I want to talk to smack bang in the middle there, engage with the display in a hands-on way in more than five seconds. Uh, the most popular exhibit based on that was the type of rock exhibit where, where the igneous metamorphic sedimentary rocks and the magnifying glass. That exhibit was used as a hook for the booth. That was closest to the road as people were walking past. We were, we were aiming that as people would walk past, they'd see some rocks, see a shiny magnifying glass and be drawn over to have a look. Um, so what does this mean? Potentially that shiny rocks attract people. Shiny rocks and fossils, because there was a fossil in that sedimentary rock as well. And, and people potentially have an innate curiosity when they see these things. Um, and I think this innate curiosity is reinforced, still staying in that, engaging in a, in a hands-on way more than five seconds, with the second most popular exhibit, which was the properties of rocks, that inquiry-based, really open, in, in encouraging engagement and picking up the rocks, feeling them. Many people's reaction to specifically holding the magnetite, which was one of the rocks in that, in that um, in that exhibit, they they didn't understand how heavy it, it was when they picked it up, how dense it was, and and how magnetic it actually is. We had a magnet there, and the magnet would jump to the magnet, and you got a really nice kind of public, a really nice reaction when the public engaged with that. 
and another interesting thing that I noticed uh, for the uh, mapping underground exhibit, it was furthest back in the tent, so it didn't get a lot of attention, but the attention that it did get was really, really rewarding and interesting to observe. When people figured out how to use the exhibit itself and found the little magnetic deposits under the ground, it probably got the best audible reaction of, oh, like, oh, wow, and then they would call someone over and, and they would try and find all the other little bits of magnetic material in that exhibit. Uh, one of the most fun exhibits to watch was this one here. What do you think is underground? Blank canvas, whiteboard marker, go. And these are some of the, some of the uh, more coherent drawings that we had, <laughs> which is, might be a stretch for some of those up there anyway. Um, some more again. They're good drawings, aren't they? <laughs> I did those drawings. Uh, and then also we have some more, I would say, informed drawings where we can actually see some labels. Dead bodies made quite an appearance there as well, but we, we've got some, some labelled layers uh, as well in our, in our public knowledge. Uh, and then I think our favourite one, you, you probably recognise this from the thumbnail. Um, Aliens underground, potentially, wondering what is above ground. So, so there was a, a nice array of drawings that we got on this. Um, some of them were just really fun and some were really interesting to actually see what people thought was underground. And this is a breakdown of that data, of all the photos that we took, which wasn't a photo of every single drawing. Um, I, I went through and, and had a look at what the features were in each of those drawings. So right at the top, we had 22 instances of layers of some sort so people know that there are layers under the ground next pop next most popular thing bones and dead things <laughs> that includes dinosaurs and people drawing their brother or sister and writing their name <laughs> something like that people know that rocks are underground which is great lava and magma going all the way down uh, water and minerals tunnels caves aliens and monsters made a, a little appearance there and i really like at the bottom the soil boundaries and the geological features they were labeled um, as horizons and faults so people were happy to share that knowledge and put that knowledge on there that that, that was where they stood that was where they stood um it was it was generally observed that people were hesitant to engage with the whiteboard at first either from a confidence standpoint uh being judged on their skill other people watching them draw or from a place where they didn't want to erase what was already on there. They didn't want to rub away someone else's drawings. That was more in the case of adults. Kids would just go, <laughs> whatever, I'm going to draw on that. Um, and this gives us a nice bit of insight to where people are starting from, where their knowledge is starting from when we go in to have a conversation with them. So what did we learn overall? Rocks are cool. We know that. And so to public. One very interesting thing that Margie noticed when talking to people is that when playing with rocks, particularly with adults, sometimes it brought a feeling of nostalgia of their childhood, potentially of playing with Lego or building sandcastles, something like that. Um, rocks bring out our inner child scientists, people playing with those, the properties of rocks, the magnets, weighing them, organizing them by size. Um, and is that a product of hands-on learning and engagement? So how was this experience? It was new not only for Geoscience Australia, but it was also new for myself and for many others in the booth. And it was exciting to approach this with a new technique. We didn't know how it would go. We didn't know how many surveys we would do, how many surveys we would need, how many people would come. So we actually got our data, but it was all part of the learning. And it was a strange feeling observing people. Uh, Alice and Maggie liken it to cutting holes in newspaper and watching people kind of walk past. Um, but once you got used to the observation, you kind of realise that people watching can be fun. And, and in this sense, we were getting data out of that as well. Uh, and it was difficult sometimes to resist the urge to put the clipboard down and to go and facilitate, go and engage. If you saw someone scratching their head or looking a bit confused, it was 
for, for some of us, there was this innate feeling that you had to put it down and go and go and have a conversation. Uh, the most difficult thing in my experience was designing the sheet itself. What were we actually looking for? What information do we want to get out of this? Uh, and the timing and tracking sheet, that observation sheet went through a few iterations and a lot of the suggestions came from uh, the GA staff who helped us on the day and in the lead up. So thank you to all of those people. Um, uh, going back to, I chatted to Margie about this a little bit. One of her experiences that she found difficult was it was hard to stay consistent with identifying one person to observe. Sometimes you select a person and they're not very engaging to observe, but you can't change to someone else because they're interacting and, and you want to get better data because the good data is the person not observing as well. There's definitely a big place for more evaluation like this, particularly when looking to evaluate exhibitions and interactive products. We've got a good number of stats, a lot of idea on people's interests and ideas and backgrounds, um, all information that we can use to develop more public facing programs and, and public targeted products. Uh, and my last little thing was it worth doing. Yes, it gave us some good food for thought on how to set up these interactive exhibits, not only in a physical way in the space, but also into what the public enjoy, what they're what they're looking for, what they already know. And that is all just information we can use to, to continue to develop our products and develop new products. That's all well and good, but what does it actually mean for our audience? What is the implication? I thought um, you were going to do it instead. No, but sure, by all means, you can have something if you like. <laughs> Really briefly to wrap up, thank you so much for listening and bearing with us all. Hopefully it's been an interesting journey. Um, not many of these talks involve dead bodies, so I hope that we've we've ticked that box off. To sort of wrap up, I, I wanted to say that we have spent an awful lot of time today talking about what the public think about earth science, what the public think about our proposed ideas. But in some ways, I feel like a klaxon from QI should go off every time we say the public, because the public are not one homogenous group of people. They're incredibly diverse. While we definitely had very strong trends in feedback, different people will always have different preferred learning styles, different things that they're interested in. And so we can't please everyone in what we do. That's just impossible. We have spent a lot of time working with a public spaces working group, so staff from right across GA, and then also consulting in other ways from staff to learn about the sorts of work they want to share with visitors and how they want to share it. And as you've seen today, we've now been working on the other side of the coin to find out what potential visitors want to do with us. But it's really important to keep in mind that everyone is different. Everyone will have individual preferences. So if you see someone in the foyer, have a chat to them about what they like. But remember, that's one tiny piece of data in a very, very broad ecosystem that we're working with. We really hope that this work will help to make our public spaces better. And hopefully it's relevant for everyone at Geoscience Australia because our work touches the lives of all Australians. So understanding where Australians come at our work and think about our work should be valuable for all of us. So thank you so much for listening. Um, happy to hand back over to Rod, but we're happy to take any questions in a moment. Have a lovely rest of your day.